Hello, people. <laughs> so when I was in high school, I spent my first two years of high school at a, uh, a typical big public school. And then my last two years, I went to this minuscule little Christian school that was attached to my minuscule little Baptist church, right? So I would go to school there five days a week, and then I would also go to church there Sunday morning, Sunday night, and all the good Baptists said, Did somebody say Thursday over here? <laughs> not a good Baptist. <laughs> Wednesday night, right? And not only did I, did I spend seven days a week there going to school, I would have sports practice after school, basketball or football or something like that. And then I was also a janitor at the school to help pay for my tuition. So I'd be, be there after school, after practice. I'd be there on su uh, Saturdays, you know, getting crayon off desks and throwing trash away and all that kind of stuff. Matter of fact, uh, very often I'd spend spring break in there with my buddy, and we would be waxing and stripping all the floors in the whole church during spring break. So I spent a lot of time in this place. Um, in fact, my buddy Mark, he's, uh, we worked here together, and one time when we were waxing and stripping the floors, he got the bright idea to say, hey, let's see what happens if we dump all the chemicals in the same bucket. And, <laughs> right? And um, nothing exploded. All my digits are still in place, but the floors were real sticky after that. They got dirty real fast, and so we had to go back in and strip them all and wax them all again after all that. My friends, we'd wing donuts at each other in the parking lot. We'd play games trying to scare each other to death as they're working at night in the building. I say all that to say this, that this whole place was my whole little world. Okay? The, the, the adults that had the most influence on me were a part of this church, the pastor, you know, teachers and uh, older students even who had invested in me. My, I, God had really gotten a hold of me in this church. It was really an amazing time in life. And I spent my last two years of high school there. Now, my second year of uh, high school was my senior year. And as I'm heading towards graduation, I start to sense there's some unrest amongst the adults in the church. And we're getting out to graduation. There's some big meeting that happens. And they get out of the meeting, and they come to me and say, Troy, um, the school has been shut down, and uh, the church is splitting. And all these adults who I had so much respect for, and had my faith was so entangled in these relationships and in this organization, was really let down. And this happened the day before graduation. So I'm supposed to graduate the next day. There's no pomp and circumstance. There's no cap and gown. There's no ceremony. There's like, hey, good job. Here's your diploma. And it was kind of anticlimactic. I got to tell you, I was pretty disillusioned and pretty disappointed. And these adults who I thought should know better were saying all these regrettable things across the aisle from one another. And it really felt like the wheels were coming off my little world. Maybe that's you today. Maybe that job that held so much promise turned out to not be what it was uh, made out to be. Maybe a significant relationship in your life is, is precarious right now. And it gives you all kinds of unrest and all kinds of anxiety. Just maybe there's a big election coming up in two days. And that's got you a little worked up. You might be frustrated. You might be fearful. You might genuinely be angry. It might feel as if the wheels are coming off your world. And even though these feelings we feel, they, they're real and they're valid, I think as we look at Scripture and we understand that we are part of a much greater story, a much grander story than just the story of our personal lives and even the story of our nation, that we are part of God's mega narrative where He is the boss, where He is sovereign. And I think somehow, somehow for me, it gives us comfort to know we are part of something so much larger. It gives us a perspective on our present circumstances. The big idea for the series is this. The story of Jesus and his church begins in the Bible and continues with us. It begins with, in the Bible and continues with us. God's great narrative. There's a theologian, his name is N.T. Wright. I love this guy. I love his writing. And he looks at the big story of Scripture kind of like a five-act play. And in the first act, God creates the heavens and the earth, and it's all good. Everything is awesome. In the second act, sin enters the world, and everything gets messed up. In the third act, God is separating Israel out as his people. He's establishing them as a nation, and it's through Israel that leads to the fourth act, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And then Jesus is crucified. He's buried, and he's risen again. 
and he ascends to the right hand of the Father. And in the second chapter of Acts, he sends the Holy Spirit, and it begins the era of the church. And this is the fifth act. This is the era that you and I are now in. And this, is, this act of the play is not done. And we have roles to play in this play. And we are a part of its progression. We are a part of so much, some, something so much greater. And Paul writes to his protege in 2 Timothy, who is he's in charge of... Uh, the, the church in the city of Ephesus, getting it aligned, getting it healthy, moving it forward. And we've got to understand, as Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, we gotta, it's going to help us know what kind of circumstance he's in. What's the situation is Paul writing from? First of all, we've got to understand that Paul has endured unbelievable hardship. Paul is giving some advice to Timothy on what to do when it feels like the wheels are coming off. And if anybody knows what it's like to have the wheels come off, it's Paul. This is a man who has been beaten, he has been robbed, he has been starved, he has been flogged, he has been shipwrecked, he is lost in the open sea for three days at one point in time. And he writes this letter to Timothy after he had been imprisoned. And now we find him in a Roman jail for the second time. See, the first time he was imprisoned, it was kind of more like house arrest, right? It was, it was you know, fairly tame. But now he is literally in a Roman dungeon. And he knows that the end is near. He's writing Timothy in Ephesus while he's in chains. And he's about to endure his final trial and be executed. And this is a man who has seen up close and personal what the Romans do to people who resist Rome. See, the Romans, when you, they would go into a new area and they would conquer this area and they would take out anybody who was resisting them and they'd say, hey, Caesar is Lord, right? And you had to say, Caesar is Lord. And the Christians are turning and saying, um... Jesus is Lord. What? No, that's not how this goes. The Romans were famous for saying, you know, there is no greater men given among men by which you must be saved other than that of Caesar. And the Christians are turning around saying, there's no greater name than that of Jesus. And Paul is taking this message to the Gentile world, and he is coming up against the Romans, and now he is imprisoned for this message of the king of kings. Jesus the Christ. So Paul knows exactly what's in store for him. He's about to die. And if anybody had the right to ask, why me, it was Paul. Have you ever had a case of the why me's? Right? We all get a case of the why me's, right? It's the human condition. Something goes wrong, something goes poorly. And we ask ourselves legitimately, why me? Why now? Why this circumstance? And Paul certainly had a reason to ask, why me? The guy did everything right. He turned his back on a prestigious way of life to follow after Christ. He let go of everything, every security, every comfort that he had to follow Jesus and to spread this message of the risen Christ to the Gentile world. He has sacrificed everything. And what does he get for it? He gets chains. He gets persecuted. He gets beaten. And yet, from the darkness of a Roman dungeon, he writes this to Timothy to encourage this young man. He says this, I've run hard right to the finish, believed all the way. All that's left now is the shouting, God's applause. Depend on it. He's an honest judge. He'll do right, not only by me, but by everyone eager for his coming. Now, how on earth can he say this, given what he's gone through? This is a man who had met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, and it changed him forever. And this is a man who found his confidence not in his circumstances, but found his confidence in the one who was raised from the dead. And it's while he is in prison in Roman chains that he tells Timothy, as well as you and I, exactly why he has that kind of confidence. And I'm going to read this next passage of Scripture, and I want you to just kind of listen real closely. And if you were to summarize what Paul has tried to tell Timothy, see if you can't put that in just a few words. And listen to this. For the Spirit God gives us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. See, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. 
And that is why I am suffering as I am. Yet, this is no cause for shame. Because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. How would you summarize what Paul's trying to tell Timothy? The big idea for today is this, and this is how I would summarize it. Jesus is still Lord, and it's going to be okay. Jesus is still Lord, and it's going to be okay. Despite the circumstances, despite the way things look, over the arc of history, he is sovereign over the bigger story. And you can trust him because it's going to be okay. So we're going to make this sort of our call and response. This is going to be our little liturgical work for the day here. I'm going to, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say, Jesus is still Lord, and you're going to say, it's going to be okay. Let's practice that. Jesus is still Lord, and it's going to be okay. Jesus is still Lord, and it's going to be okay. so how does Paul encourage us in his last days as he's looking death in the eye? See, Paul's writing these encouragements to Timothy, and he shows us by example and by word how to endure and how to transcend the darkest of circumstances in a world where the tide of culture feels like it's pushing against you. How do you find your joy? Where do you place your hope? Where do you place your confidence? I'm going to give you four different encouragements as we walk through the message here today, and I want you to take a good close look at these and just ask yourself this question, which one of these has my name on it? First of all, Keep enduring. Keep enduring. <laughs> Paul is speaking to a people who have been under the heel of unjust government for a very long time. They have been ruled by other nations, been ruled by, we would say, pagan nations, nations that the Jews would find offensive in like every conceivable way, whether it was the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the Romans who worshipped different gods, who had different customs, who had different cultural values, different so sexual mores different ways that they liked to do business, and everything about them was offensive to the Jews, and they had lived for year after year after year after decade after century after century under unjust government. It would be like for us. What, what, what about this? What if ISIS won? What if ISIS won, and we were an occupied nation by this foreign power? They, they ruled the government, and we all lived under Sharia law. Think about how offensive that is to your American independent sensibilities. And then figure you're living under that for centuries. And that's kind of what you have with the Jewish people. And then this new Messiah surfaces, and this new movement surfaces, and it gets this unbelievable persecution. First, Paul starts off by being one of the guys persecuting the Christians. Then he becomes a champion of the whole thing. And systematically, year after year after year, the Christians are marginalized and pushed to the side and persecuted. Matter of fact, historians will tell you it is miraculous that Christianity survived the first 300 years because the resistance was so brutal and so awful. That Christians were killed for entertainment in the Colosseum. They were torn apart by lions. They would be hung in Nero's garden as, as lamps to light the way. Children would be separated from their parents and sold into slavery over and over again for year after year after year. And yet think about this. There had been a lot of other wannabe messiahs. And every time this Messiah would kind of step up and say, hey, I'm fulfilling the scripture, and he would get a little bit of movement gone, they would kill him, and the movement would go away, time after time after time. But this Messiah rises up, and the movement starts, and they kill him, and the movement explodes, and it permeates the Roman Empire, so much so that 30 years later, just 30 years later, in Rome, in the center of civilization... Nero has, has Rome burnt, and he, there's so many Christians there that he blames the Christians for burning Rome. Do you understand how profound that is? There's no printing press. There's no internet. There are no telephones. There's no wire. There's no newspaper, right? There are no airplanes, no cars. The best they have is something akin to the Pony Express. And in just 30 years, from this little remote corner of the Roman Empire, Christianity is taking center stage in Rome itself. How does that happen? And it survives the next 300 years, and here we are 2,000 years later, and we're still talking about it. Paul writes this to Timothy. 
You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith and patience, love, and my endurance. You know all the things that happened to me. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And nobody's looking for persecution, right? None of us is out there looking, looking to make an example of ourselves. But I got to tell you, even today in 2016, Christians around the world are persecuted in the most profound way. Anywhere from the Christians who've been pushed out of their homes in Syria to our very own leaders, Westside Family Church leaders in Laos, our forest pastors are, are sending in prayer requests and saying, hey, please pray for us. Our pastors are being beaten because of the faith. And when our teams go over there, we have to like buy burner phones and act almost like it's like the CIA or something just to get in there to spread the love of Jesus to these people. Now, in the United States, we don't have that kind of persecution just yet. But I want to tell you this. In our lifetimes, we've got to understand that Christians have enjoyed sort of a cultural privilege in this country. And in our lives, that privilege is going away. And we feel the loss of it. We chafe from the loss of it. Sometimes it makes us frustrated. It makes us angry. But it's, that toothpaste isn't going back in the tube. And as Christ followers, what is Paul encouraging us to do? He See, Jesus promised us it was going to be hard. It was hard for Paul, right? How's that for your prosperity gospel, right? The apostle Paul was tormented, persecuted, killed out of a Roman dungeon. Jesus himself the early Christians, the first 300 years of Christianity, Christians around the world today. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. But in John 16, Jesus says this, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I am still Lord over humanity, Lord over the greater course of history. And if it looks bad right now, we get it. It looks bad. It's hard. It's difficult. I promise you it would, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Why? Because Jesus is still Lord and try one more time. Jesus is still Lord, and it's, it's going to be okay. Next, we keep learning. We're going to keep learning. We're going to have open hearts and open minds to keep learning. Rick Warren used to say all the time, leaders are learners. And as soon as you stop learning, you start regressing. As soon as you lock everything down, it starts to degrade. And Paul writes to Timothy, he says this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned, circle that word learned, and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Circle that last phrase, wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We are to be immersed in the Scriptures the way Jesus was immersed in the Scriptures. With the understanding that every story, every verse, every command, every poem, every bit of prophecy points beyond itself and finds its fulfillment in Him and Him alone. See, he is the context for our understanding of Scripture. And the beauty of it is this. As you and I grow in our relationship with God, words like grace and mercy and kindness and forgiveness grow with us. As we get older, we start to see the beauty of it. It's like taking that, that gem, that diamond. You know, It's the same truth. It's the same gospel. But as you turn it and you see the light refract in different ways and different angles, and that's how we are as we grow in our faith with Jesus. These things don't become less profound. They become more simple and more profound all at the same time. And they don't have zero-sum definitions like a mathematical equations. Two plus two equals four, and then that's all it's ever going to mean. You can't lock them down like that. These are things that we grow in for the rest of our lives. At my, uh, the last church I was at, there was another pastor on staff who's a really, really good guy, but he used to bug me, man. You've never had anybody do that for you, I'm sure. Um, and uh, he used to pontificate about our particular faith tradition and how awesome it was and how we just had everything right. He was very, and one time, and he caught me on a really bad day, I think. He, he came into my office, and he was just like letting us know. I was like, isn't it great that we just have this stuff nailed down and that we're so correct, we're so right, and all these other people, they could learn so much from us. And I just, I just kind of lost my mind. I just said, buddy, listen. How many doctrines do you hold to that you know are wrong? And the answer is like, you know, none doctrines. Because you wouldn't hold to it if you thought it was wrong. And yet, and yet, do you really believe when we get to the other side, God is going to pat you on the back and say, buddy, 
You crushed doctrinal correctness. Good job. You got it right. All the rest of these hanyaks haven't messed up, but you and your faith tradition nailed it. Or maybe, just maybe, you can open up your aperture just a little bit and say that, hey, there may be some things that we could learn from other corners of the body of Christ. That perhaps from our orthodox brothers and sisters, there's something that we can learn, something beautiful, something that maybe they have more, they're more in touch with than we do. Maybe from our Catholic brothers and sisters, maybe from our charismatic brothers and sisters, from our mainline brothers and sisters, that there's something beautiful about the breadth and the depth of the body of Christ that if we would just be humble and teachable, we could get something beautiful out of it. Instead of locking down our little world and saying, this is all it is and all it's ever going to be. And I'm not saying you don't approach things with discernment. I'm saying you approach things with humility. And we open up our hearts to what God would have for us. Why? Because Jesus is still Lord and it's going to be okay. We keep sharing. We keep sharing. We need to keep sharing with that same heart of humility. Just the, just the way we are teachable, we share the scriptures and we approach them with humility. We've been given life and love and hope from Jesus, and my prayer is that we'll be able to share that love and hope generously and lovingly with the world around us. The Apostle Peter, he said in his letter, that he said, look, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in you, but do so with gentleness and respect. Why? Because he knew our tendency as human beings would be to share it, you know, abruptly, brashly, and in a condescending way. So be able to share this with gentleness and respect out of humility and out of love. Why? Right, so that people can hear what we have to say. That we don't get our mess in the way of the beauty of Jesus. He writes this in 2 Timothy, preach the word, circle the word, word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. In the book of John, we learned that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word, the Logos, is Jesus. The Gospel is Jesus. He is the embodiment of all of it. He is the embodiment of the Word. And we understand that the written Word, the Scriptures, relentlessly and infallibly point us to the living Word in Christ. And we as His followers are a people known by faith and hope and love. Three pretty great things. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, you know what? These are three great things. But if you had to pick one, you don't have to pick. But if you had to pick one, the greatest of these is love. And Jesus said, you will know they are my people by the love that they have in them. And I'm going to say something that be, might be kind of hard to hear. Because some of us look at a political season like this and it's kind of like a hobby. You know? You kind of take great joy in getting into the conflict. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'm going to tell you this. Please don't let our political views obscure the love of Christ. Don't let a political ideology burn down the relationships with the people that we are called to love and serve in this world. Because you know what's going to happen? Pretty soon this election can be over. Half the country is going to be stoked. The other half are buying tickets to Canada. Okay? <laughs> we know it's coming. But here's the deal. After this election, your neighbor's still your neighbor. Your coworker's still going to be there. That person at your gym, that person at, your, at Starbucks, whatever it is, that you maybe had that conversation, that kind of semi-quasi-heated argument about the political thing, those people are still people, and they are still going to be there after this is all said and done. Please don't destroy those relationships because of your hobby. See, you can still love someone and at the same time disagree with them. What? <laughs> Just because I'm in a relationship with you and I love you, and I care about you, it doesn't mean I agree with you or I condone your behavior. Those things are not mutually exclusive. The person is more important than their politics. And that individual made in the image of God is more important than my desire and your desire to be right. And we look to Jesus as our example. And the people that were least like Jesus seemed to like Jesus the best. The folks who should have embraced him were the ones that pushed him away. And the people who were on the outside, the people who were on the other side of the aisle, the people who were those people, right, that category of people, the ones that Jesus spent the most time with, the drunkards and the gluttons and the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the thieves. And he spent so much time with them that the established religious people thought he was one of them. And he was accused of being a drunkard and a glutton and a thief and a, uh, and a tax collector. 
Jesus is the great category buster. Why? Because when you look at somebody else just through their ideology, just through that, they just, they're just a bundle of annoyances, right? They just they bug the crap out of you. And you look at them, you just go, you know what? This person isn't a person anymore. They're a category. And we start to see that this is a person made in the image of God. Dare I say this, that Jesus loves Hillary <laughs> and Jesus loves Donald and Jesus loves loves Gary and Jill and Marco and Ted and whoever you want to put out there, that those people are souls made in the image of God, loved for eternity by Jesus as if they were the only one who ever lived. And you and I are meant to be purveyors of love and purveyors of kindness and humility. I'm not saying we don't have convictions. I'm not saying that we don't have uh, hills that we might even want to die on. But the kingdom that you and I report to was here long before there's a United States and it'll be here long after it's gone. It was here long before there were Republicans and Democrats and it'll be here long after those categories go away. But the souls of the people that come on your path are forever. And you and I, let us be wells of life and not fence builders. Why? Because Jesus is still Lord and we're going to keep on trusting. Man, trust is hard won, you know? It's hard one for me. I have trust issues, for real. And if I was ever going to lose my confidence, lose my faith, walk away from Christianity, it was going to be when I was 18 years old and that whole mess exploded the day before my graduation. Because all these people who had been so important to my, and sort of uh, integral to my faith in God, had lost their minds. And the wheels were coming off my little world. I tell you what, I may have given up on that organization. I may, may have given up on that particular local church. But by God's grace, somehow I was able to separate this. I wasn't giving up on Jesus. And I knew he wasn't giving up on me. People are always going to be disappointing. <laughs> Your circumstances are going to turn. The wheels are going to feel like they're coming off. But they were coming off for Paul. Riding from a Roman dungeon, trying to encourage his buddy Timothy, the wheels were coming off for Paul. What does he say? He says this, I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have trusted to him, my life, my soul, my everything, until that day, that day when he makes everything right. This is Paul's confidence. This is Paul's passion. This is the foundation what he stands on. And you may feel like the wheels are coming off in your life right now, whether it's from an election or a job or a relationship or a sickness or a financial crisis, whatever it is. And you may have given up on a particular thing, a particular relationship, an organization. But I want to tell you this. Jesus says to us, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. We turn our eyes to Jesus and we see the wisdom and the love that pour out of his life. And then we look at the horror and the pain and the injustice of the cross. And if you stop there, if you stop at the cross, it just looks like cruelty and futility. And I've heard people ask this question, it's like, why why was that necessary? Why couldn't God just forgive everybody and just call it good? And if you stop at the cross, that's a legitimate question. But if you go beyond the cross and we go to an empty tomb and we put our hands in the wounds of the risen Savior, see, the cross means something else now. It means so much more. Where it was humility, uh, it was cruelty and futility. Now, it's something else. It tells us that beyond the pain, there is healing. That on the other side of brokenness, there was wholeness. That on the other side of injustice, things will be made right. And that on the other side of death, there is life. Because it's in Him that we have our hope. A hope that transcends our circumstances. Because Jesus is still Lord and and it's going to be okay. So we're going to spend a moment and we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for us here as a people. I'm going to pray for this election, for our nation. And then together, we'll have the words up on the screen here. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. And let this be our statement today. So God, we come before you. 
and all of our humanity and all of our convoluted motives and all of our uh, self-regarding desire to be right. And we place those things at your feet. And we take our fear and our anxiety and our frustration and we place that at your feet because you can be trusted. Because if the cross says anything, it says that you were willing to step into our mess. You were willing to suffer the pain and injustice of humanity to show us that it wasn't the end, that it, death doesn't have the last word. And so we find our courage in you and our confidence in you. And we lift up our nation in this election, God, that you redeem it for something beautiful. And we lift up this church, Lord, that you would continue to move powerfully in this place because your name and your renown is the desire of our hearts, Lord. Let us be a place of healing and a place of hope. And as Jesus taught us how to pray, we pray this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Because Jesus is still Lord and it's going to be okay. God bless you, Westside. We'll see you next week.